I want to welcome all of you who are watching this via the internet. A special welcome to our Crossing Church family who are joining us from our St. John's and our Gander locations. I am praying that you are all doing well at this time of social distancing and self-isolation. And I can tell you that I am more than looking forward to getting back together with everyone. But for now, we'll follow the rules and we'll do our part to prevent the spread of this virus. So please do sit, stay safe during this time. Well, last week we started a brand new message series called Dear Churches, Messages from Jesus in the Book of Revelation. I want to give credit to two of our main resources that I've been using during this series, Daryl Johnson's commentary called Discipleship on the Edge and Gordon Fee's The Revelation, a New Testament book study. So just to give some further context and build on last week's message, this is the revelation of Jesus Christ. And the Apostle John had an amazing encounter with Jesus while he was in exile. We read in Revelation 1 that John had been exiled to an island prison called Patmos. He was well into his 80s at the time, and he was sent there because of his refusal to worship the emperor as was decreed for all Roman citizens. He refused to go to the temp temple of the emperor, Domitian, throw incense into the fire at the altar, and declare that Caesar is Lord. No, he would only worship Jesus, the one true Lord. So he was considered a troublemaker who threatened the unity of the empire. But it's interesting because while many disciples of Jesus refused to do this and were arrested, um, most of them were later executed. John, however, was considered too big a figure among the believers, too big of an influence. And the last thing that the Romans wanted was the power of the legend of a martyr to fuel this disruptive cause. And so John was arrested and sent away to work in the rock quarries there. Well, let's take a moment and we'll read the account that John gives regarding the circumstances surrounding this encounter with Jesus while he was in exile. It's all set up in Revelation uh, chapter 1. I'm going to read from verses 9 through to 11. It says, I, John, your brother and companion in the suffering and kingdom and patient endurance that are ours in Jesus, was on the island of Patmos because of the word of God and the testimony of Jesus. On the Lord's day, I was in the spirit, and I heard behind me a loud voice like a trumpet, which said, write on a scroll what you see, and send it to the seven churches, to Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamum, Thyatria, Tyra, Sardis, Philadelphia, and Laodicea. So if you continue reading in chapter 1, you'll notice that John was having an actual physical experience in response to the vision that he saw. He heard a loud voice behind him. We don't know if anyone else heard it, but John sure did. And he said in verse 12, he said, I turned around to see the voice that was speaking to me. And then with incredible imagery, he described what he saw. Seven golden lampstands, which we learned represented the seven churches in Asia Minor, or modern-day Turkey. He employs similes as he tries to put into words his description of Jesus, the risen and victorious Jesus. For example, he says, the hair on his head was like was white like wool. His eyes were like blazing fire. His voice was like the sound of rushing waters, and so on. Well, these images would stir the imagination of those who would have read this account. They would know what white wool was, what blazing fire looked like. They would be familiar with the sound of rushing water. And John reports that he is holding, the Son of Man, Jesus is holding seven stars, which we learned represented the seven angels or messengers and protectors of the churches. This is the revelation of Jesus Christ, or the apocalypse of Jesus, which described how he was revealing himself in this letter, unveiling or opening the cover, as Johnson says, dynamically breaking through. 
And so he directed John to write the seven churches, as mentioned before. And last week, we started off with the first letter to the church in Ephesus. You remember that Jesus credited them with being very hard workers, with persevering and protecting the church from false doctrines and false teachers. But the one thing that mattered the most, they had forsaken. The one thing that Jesus held against them. That was the love that they had at first for him. They had forsaken that love, their love and devotion to Jesus. So today, we're moving on to the second church highlighted in these messages from Jesus, the church in Smyrna. And if you have your Bibles with you, you can turn with me right now. We're going to look at Revelation chapter 2. We're going to continue on, verses 8 through 11. But first, as always, I want to pray, and then we'll dive in. So will you pray with me? Jesus, we thank you um, that you reveal yourself through your word and that your Holy Spirit speaks to us powerfully through it, and we want to learn from you today. So, Father, we pray that you would open our eyes, soften our hearts, and open our ears. Help us to be open to what you have for us. Thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, just some context of this city. Um, Smyrna was a crown jewel city in Asia Minor, situated in an ideal location. Its beauty even rivaled that of Ephesus. Smyrna thrives in present day as a city now called Izmir, the third largest city in Turkey. There was a temple built in honor of Tiberius, and it became a leading city in emperor worship, according to Gordon Fee. Emperor worship would be highlighted at every public gathering where citizens would have to declare that the emperor was Lord and Savior. And so the church was under great pressure to conform, as we will learn. But we'll also notice, as we read this passage, that Jesus' usual pattern of writing to the churches is interrupted in his message to the church in Smyrna. Usually, the pattern of the messages went this way. Jesus identified himself to the churches. He applauded the churches for what they were doing right. He told them what he held against them and warned them what would happen if they didn't repent. And then he gave them a promise of hope or reward if they did. But for two of the seven churches, there was one piece of the pattern that was omitted. Those churches were Smyrna and Philadelphia. So as we go through this passage, Let's see if we can discover the difference in his message to this church. So let's begin. Let's start with verse 8. To the angel of the church of Smyrna write, These are the words of him who is the first and the last who died and came to life again. Jesus started off by identifying himself the same way that God identified himself in the book of Isaiah. For instance, I, the Lord, with the first of them and the last, I am he. That's Isaiah 41.4. I am the first and I am the last and there is no God besides me. Isaiah 44.6. I am he. I am the first and I am the last. Isaiah 48.12. This is a reminder to the church that Jesus holds the boundaries of all life. And Johnson says it this way. Whatever happens in their history, Jesus is there as the first word, and Jesus will be there as the last word. It's also interesting to note that Jesus addressed each church differently in the way that he identified himself. And it's significant how he identified himself to this church as the first and the last who died and came to life again. So you may be asking, why is this significant? Well, Johnson says that he did this to show them that he knew what life in Smyrna was all about. Scholars say that the city of Smyrna was the first in everything. In fact, stamped on its coins was the phrase, the city, the first city of Asia in size and beauty. The first city. It loved being first. But it had been destroyed in 580 BC and then rebuilt again in 290 BC. So this city had been dead and then brought back to life again, a kind of resurrection. So Jesus referred to himself as the one who truly was the first and the last, the one who died and came to life again. Let's continue. 
Verse 9, I know your afflictions and your poverty, yet you are rich. I know about the slander of those who say that they are Jews and are not, but are a synagogue of Satan. Very, very strong words here. The word afflictions is a strong word in Greek. It means pressure or crushing pressure. The church was under pressure like a huge boulder was pressing in on them. And this lampstand was being light in their city, a light that revealed the darkness of sin, of emperor worship, and ultimately rejection of God's way. Christians in Smyrna were constantly pressured to give in and worship the emperor. And as I mentioned earlier, every public event would start with a moment where people were called to adore the emperor and declare him Savior and Lord. But Christians wouldn't do it. Not these Christians, and they suffered greatly because of it. They experienced extreme poverty because they rejected worshiping the emperor and they strove to live life and work in the way Jesus was calling them to do, to live differently. So they were ostracized and no one would support their businesses. They would lose their work because they would be seen as enemies of both the emperor and enemies of the Jews who would often aid in the disciples' arrest. In fact, Jesus said those Jews were actually not true Jews as they had rejected the promised Messiah and instead they did Satan's work when they joined in persecuting his church. It was easy to take actions against these believers because everyone was doing it. And one scholar suggests that perhaps it was economic pressure from these Jews that brought the church to poverty and slanderous accusations by them for Satan means slanderer that led to imprisonment and death. But Jesus assured the church when he said, I know, I know what you're going through. Imagine hearing from Jesus in such circumstances that he knew their afflictions. He knew the crushing pressure that they were under, and he knew their poverty because of their faith. Yet he reminded them that indeed they were rich, certainly not rich in earthly possessions, but rich in what truly mattered, their faithful love and devotion to Jesus and his gospel message. Let's go on. Do not be afraid of what you are about to suffer. I tell you, the devil would put some of you in prison to test you, and you will suffer persecution for 10 days. Be faithful, even to the point of death, and I will give you life as your victor's crown. Jesus said, don't be afraid. Suffering is going to happen. Don't be surprised by it. In fact, expect it, but don't be afraid. And then Jesus identified yet another element that would be at work in the midst of their suffering. Not only would they face hostility from political and religious leaders, but he reminded them that there was a spiritual element to their suffering. Jesus warned them. He said, the devil will put some of you in prison to test you and you will suffer persecution for 10 days. Jesus reminded them of the reality of the spiritual battle that they were in. It wasn't only physical. There was more going on than indeed they could see. And Johnson offers this insight. Behind the threatened political forces and the hostile religious forces was the power of evil out to destroy Jesus Christ and all that he has made. The real opposition is spiritual. The devil's target was Jesus. And since Jesus was already victorious, he tried to destroy his church. Jesus said that this suffering would last for 10 days. And we don't know if this was a literal 10 days or if it simply highlighted that there would be a limited time. And Johnson points out that the number 10 in human terms meant completion. You have 10 fingers, you have 10 toes, Maybe 10 days could possibly mean a complete trial. Above all, Jesus was in control. 
And as one author notes, but God is supreme. Even through the devil and evil men, he works out his purposes. And although the devil actively tried to make them falter, to walk away from their faith and from Jesus, Jesus told them to be faithful and not give in. This suffering would be a test of their faith. In fact, it would prove their faith. Life would be hard. In fact, they may even face death. But hold fast. In the end, Jesus promised them if they did, their faithfulness in the midst of intense suffering would produce a victor's crown, like a laurel wreath given to an athlete who won a race. And one author says the victory wreath would be especially appropriate in Smyrna, a city famous for its games. And let's finish off. Whoever has ears, let them hear what the Spirit says to the churches. The one who is victorious will not be hurt at all by the second death. Remember that term, let them hear. If those who have ears, let them hear. It meant not just hearing, but it meant obeying and doing what Jesus had commanded them to do. The ones who were faithful, even to the point of physical death, would experience eternal life. They wouldn't experience the second death, which was eternal death, forever separated from God. God always blesses the reading of his word. What an amazing message from Jesus to a pretty amazing church. I highlight at the start of the message that Jesus, after identifying who he was to the churches in these messages, in these letters, he identified what they were doing right, and then he pointed out what they were doing wrong when he said, but this I hold against you. He gave them a warning of what would happen if they didn't change and a promised reward if they did. Well, the missing statement in the message to the church in Smyrna is, did you catch it? Can you guess? But this I hold against you. We don't see that in this message. In fact, we don't see it to in the message to the church in Philadelphia as we're going to study later on. So what's going on here? Well, it seems that Jesus had nothing to hold against this church. In the midst of tremendous suffering, they were still doing things right. They still remained faithful. They were a lampstand that was shining brightly in a very dark place. And the darkness didn't like it, and therefore it mobilized against them. But as Johnson notes, of the seven messages, the one to the disciples in Smyrna best explains why it's so hard to be a faithful disciple of Jesus in our time. Why it's so hard to stay in love. Indeed, in some countries today, Christians around the world are suffering in real time, facing daily severe persecution and death for Jesus' sake. And yet they stand firm and the gospel spreads like wildfire. But we here in our context, we don't face such pressure. Our lives aren't threatened um, when we attend church or Bible study or when we continue to have freedom to worship, however that looks like in our circumstances today. However, on a different level, when you think of it, we do face similar struggles, although they may not be life-threatening as followers of Jesus in our context today. There's a pressure to worship people and things other than God, as is evidenced by our consumer-driven economy and the unusual preoccupation with the rich and the famous. We're challenged each day not to buy into the values of our world where self-gratification and self-preservation are central. We live in a world where the accumulation of wealth and the reliance on it for security are the main drives in life. We can see the outcome of this today, can't we? During this pandemic, security and wealth seems to be the driving force of the decisions that are being made rather than the value of human life. Just as he called the church in Smyrna, Jesus is calling us to live in a radically different way. And as a result, we will face rejection and opposition as well. 
As followers of Jesus and as his church, he commands us to let our light shine as we live in dark times. He reminds us that there is active evil in our world. We know this as there's still hunger and poverty. We see the greed-fed wars and rivalry, selfish rulers and powers that are against God's plan for the flourishing of everyone in the world. But we don't even need to have to look globally. We don't need to look that far to see active evil in the world. As just last week, we saw the results of tremendous evil at work and the senseless loss of the 22 precious lives in Nova Scotia. And our deep condolences go out to all those who are affected by these losses. So we have to acknowledge that we live in a world where there is darkness. And just as the church in Smyrna experienced darkness, we are experiencing darkness and dark times as well. And just as the Christians in Smyrna, who were light in dark times, experienced opposition and hardship, so we are called to be light. And there will be times when the light will not be welcome. We may be afraid of what will happen if we speak up and expose injustice or unkindness, or if we don't embrace what others around us are embracing in our work ethic or in our business practices. We may be afraid that we'll be ostracized or rejected by friends and coworkers. We don't want to admit, in fact, that we're followers of Jesus because of the poor reputation that Christianity sadly has gotten over the years. The pressure to behave in ways that go with the crowd is very real, especially for our children, our youth, and our young adults. And yet we are called to live differently, to be light in dark places. It's hard to remember that it's the light of Christ that is lived out in us that is exposing the darkness in the world. And so we should expect op opposition and hardship. These words from John, he writes about this in John 3, 19 through 20. He says this, this is the verdict. Light has come into the world, but people loved darkness instead of light because their deeds were evil. Everyone who does evil hates the light and will not come into the light for fear that their deeds will be exposed. If we're being light, that is shining the light of Christ in our world, that means that through us, in our attitudes and actions, Jesus is calling us to actively, lovingly expose the evil in our world to see what is unseen, the spiritual battle that is going on behind the scenes. As we look at the events that are happening in the world, you know, from a biblical perspective, from a Jesus perspective, we know that there's a battle going on. And we are called then to be light in those dark places. In Ephesians 6, verse 12, the apostle reminds us, for our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. The struggle is real, my friends. But we don't need to be afraid. The battle is not ours. The battle is the Lord's. And even though it seems that evil has the upper hand, even though it seems like evil is winning, we are reminded of Jesus' words to the church in Smyrna. Evil is on a leash. The devil is limited. And ultimately, the true light, the light of Jesus Christ, will prevail. Meanwhile, our trials and our tests are there to prove our faith in Jesus. And if we allow him, he will use them to transform us to be more and more like him. And so we need to hold on and we need to remain faithful to what we know and what we believe to be true. All the enemy can do now is target those who seek to live Jesus' way and shine his light in the darkness. But again, we don't need to be afraid. Jesus is right there with us. He knows the struggles that we face. As we seek to live for him, it's not easy. He knows this. And we know the light will prevail, though, in the end. In John 1, 4, and 5, John describes the prevailing power of Jesus' light. 
in him, that's Jesus, was life. And that life was the light of all mankind. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. The darkness has not overcome it. When the Christians in Smyrna were experiencing persecution and rejection, it was important for them to realize that they weren't really the target, that it was Jesus, the true light shining through him who was being rejected. And it's the same for us. If we are shining light in this dark world, then we too will experience rejection. Remember, Jesus has already prevailed. The victory has already been won. It was won when Jesus died on the cross and rose again three days later, defeating sin and death. That is an amazing message, an amazing truth. And as we come to a close, I'm going to leave us with some questions of introspection for each one of us to reflect upon throughout this week. And may I suggest that you take some time with Jesus this week and maybe first ask him, what are those areas in my life that I need to allow Jesus to shine his light upon? What are those things that we don't want to let go, that we don't want to stop doing, that we don't want exposed? But what in our lives needs to be lovingly exposed by the light of the Holy Spirit, these things that are hindering our light from shining for him? Those are hard questions. But would you take some time for introspection and allow the light of the Holy Spirit to shine in those areas in your life? I know I'm going to be allowing <laughs> those areas I'm going to ask him to shine. It, it's not easy. It's not fun. But it's what he wants to do to help us to be a brighter light for him in our witness. And next, would you ask him, how is my brightness setting when it comes to shining for him in those places that need his light? Is it on the dim setting? Barely noticed, barely on? Is it set on the medium day setting where you can see some lights but it's hardly noticed? Or is it on the high beam setting where it just can't be missed and you're shining brightly for Jesus? Would you ask him to give you courage to be his light where he's calling you? Maybe it's a courageous conversation you need to have that you've been avoiding. Maybe it's a relationship that needs the light of truth and love spoken. Maybe you need to confess that you've been put under pressure to behave in ways that you know are counter to what Jesus would want for you, and you have to just admit that, and you have to stop. Maybe it's someone who needs some support and encouragement, and you need to be the light for them. Is it someone who needs your light through listening, having a listening ear, and praying for them? Is it an organization that God is calling you to be a light and support, especially during these trying times? Is it a neighbor that God is calling you to be a light for in new ways? Or maybe there's someone who needs to hear the good news of God's love and forgiveness made possible through Jesus Christ. Maybe that's the light that God is calling you to share today or this week. Now I'm going to leave you with these words from Jesus from Matthew 5, verses 10 through 12, part of Jesus' Sermon on the Mount. Blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when people insult you, persecute you, and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Rejoice and be glad. Because great is your reward in heaven, for in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. May we, as his people and as his church, experience his blessings as we courageously shine his light in our world. Let's pray. Jesus, you call us to be light in dark places. 
And Lord, this world has many dark places. We see it. And Father, it's hard for us to be courageous in these times, but you are calling us to be your light, to live in a way um, that will display your grace and your forgiveness, to live in a way that will show um, how we resolve conflict, how we experience grief and crises, knowing that you are with us. Help us to be a light for you. Show us who needs your light that we can shine for you this week and onward. Thank you, Jesus, for your message today to us as your people, as your followers, and help us to remember that you are with us and that no matter what we suffer because of uh, following you, um, you know, you know what it's like, and you will help us to be faithful even in those difficult times. We ask all this in Jesus' powerful name. Amen.